topic here tonight is writing media tie-ins, and um, always a good idea for us to just go down the line and, and introduce ourselves and, and how our careers tie in to the topic. So, okay, we'll just start with you, Adam. All right. uh, hi, I'm Adam J. Whitlatch. Uh, I'm a science fiction writer and editor with KHP Publishers. Uh, I've written two, uh, well, I've written one, and I'm in the middle of my second media tie-in. I wrote the novelization to War of the Worlds Goliath, which is uh, nominated for a Scribe Award, which I should find out the results of that next Friday. We're going to announce the winner at San Diego Comic Con. And right now I'm... Oh, my name's in I'm going to be at British Fest oh, next, okay. next weekend, actually. <laughs> Uh, There's a bunch of awards. I'll, I'll pretend to be you. I'll go to the award ceremony as you. And, and okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> um, and right, right now I'm writing the uh, novelization to the upcoming movie no Oceanus, which is being produced by Future Dude, which is a Minneapolis production company. Uh, hi, I'm Monica Malinstelli. Um I am primarily, you would probably know a lot of my work in the gaming industry. Um, I am the overlordess on the Firefly game line. Um, I also do some other things for Firefly, which have not been announced yet. And then I also work on Vampire the Masquerade. I'm the new developer for Conan, the Barbarian RPG. And I'm also doing some, <laughs> and I'm also doing some work with um, a game called Infinity, which is a Spanish game based on the miniatures that was very popular. It's kind of like one of the nostalgia bits. Pardon? I have full time demon mark. Oh, fun! Oh, you awesome. make your turn on, oh, sorry. It's like a small world. <laughs> like a small world. Like everybody with Gen Fun, especially me. Should you all leave, go to Starbucks, hang out? Or, no, just talk to you. I think my name's kind of mistaken. Oh, well, whatever it is, I mean, and I say that I'm not a Starbucks fan. <laughs> it's just they're just ubiquitous. So right. <laughs> we'll be <laughs> straight to take those. Right. Yes. Not here. Um, I'll have to try it. No? Not here? No shake and shake? Oh, so I don't get to try that. Oh. It's much more of an Indiana. Mm. Well, for me, actually, I'm anti-Starbucks because I'm pro-Duck and Donuts because I'm from New England. Woohoo! Uh, my name's Charlotte Fullerton, and I'm a writer primarily of kids' uh, properties, but even within that, animation, television animation, um, written on shows like Tim Possible, Superhero Squad, uh, Avengers Assemble, the new Thunderbirds Are Go, that's, that's just out now, um, and a couple of our, the big, the big tie-ins that I've done, uh, Ben 10, the, the franchise from Alien Force, Ultimate Alien, and Omniverse, the video games associated with the comic books, chapter books, talking interactive, <laughs> uh, graphic novels, and then also the biggie now is My Little Pony. Um, and it's been very, very good to me. <laughs> uh, I'm David Annandale. Uh, I write uh, primarily uh, Warhammer 40,000 and uh, Horus Heresy fiction for Black Library. Uh, so most recently, uh, Damnation of Pythos and uh, Yarrick Imperial Creed with the two most recent books to uh, uh, do in the stores. Cool. Awesome. So in terms of writing media tie-ins, I guess I, maybe I can just sort of launch in because the way I got my jobs writing video games or comic books or, or all these other things chapter is because I was already writing on the show. So I got to, got approached by Cartoon Network Enterprises, these other shows outside, uh, even Bandai, the toy company, to write the packaging on the back of the, the Ben 10 toys, the names of the alien species and their home planets. I came up with all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm actually kind of interested how you guys got started because they, they approached me wanting to kind of legitimize, you know, their, their marketing materials or their, you know, and, and video games are considered marketing materials and ancillary property, uh, ancillary um, items that, that support them as a property. But I don't know that I would have just gotten in cold. Uh, Hi, I'm a video games. Like how, mm -hmm. or how do, you, how do you get started? Well, in my case, uh, it was actually my wife's fault. <laughs> Oops, seriously, it was. Um, with War of the Worlds Goliath, um, Kevin Eastman, uh, owner of Heavy Metal Magazine, was uh, executive producer on that. So Heavy Metal was running promotions for that for quite a few years. Uh, the movie's in production for about five years or so, I think. And uh, after a while, um, didn't hear anything about it. I figured it just went into development hell. And um, Then my uh, wife is a big fan of 
Peter Wingfield, like Mythos on Highlander, and he's the lead in Goliath. And so she got into his fan club, and through his fan club on Facebook, she met the director of War of the Worlds Goliath, Joe Peterson, and a couple of the other producers. And through Facebook, we just got palling around, joking around, became pretty good buds. And uh, my coworker at KHP, Jared Balzer, had written a couple of novelizations for some really bad Z grade horror flicks. And I asked him, you know, how do you get into that? I would really love to work on because I love War of the Worlds and I would love to get in on this. And he, and he said, just just ask him. Just simple as that. I think the worst they can say is no. Yeah, the worst yeah. The, the worst thing they can say is no. A no is free. It doesn't cost you anything. And so I, I mentioned it to him and they said, Well, yeah, you know, we we've, we've been considering, we have a couple of authors we're thinking about, you know, send us some samples. So I sent them my first novel and the director loved it. And uh, not long after that, I got, uh, they sent me the script, and I read through that and I said, yeah, let's, let's do this. And after a lengthy contract negotiation, with the production company is Malaysian, so the legalities were kind of sticky. But once we finally got that taken care of, then I was, was off to the races. So it's what, it's who you know and also who you can get to know online. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. How, how about you? Um, I'd, uh... That's okay, yeah. ping pong. Uh, I'd uh, had uh, three uh, books uh, published prior with a, a creator owned with, uh, but with a, a small press and uh, was uh, I was looking around for, for other markets and uh, I, I was actually uh, really I think I really love to write uh, uh, Warhammer 40k stuff that the universe really appealed to me and as luck would have it there was an open call for submissions and this is something that Black Library um, they have been doing until recently. Periodically, there'd be an open call, uh, and uh, that time they were looking for uh, short stories about one of four characters. Uh, that, so I put a pitch together for one of those characters, sent it in. With the, the, usually, when these open calls, they look for uh, the so a 500 or a thousand word pitch, uh, a summary, and uh, a, I forget if it was 500 or a thousand word sample of your writing. Uh, so I sent that in. Uh, a few months later, I heard back from the, edit the editor who liked what I sent, says, go ahead and write the story. And then they liked the story, sent us more, did a pitch for them for a novel that became The Death of Antagonists. And then from that point on, it was them coming to me saying, we want you to do X, Y, Z. Uh, so I am one of the ones who got in through just the, the open call submissions. Um, they do. and. Like I said, they do do this sometimes. In fact, currently they are advertising for two full-time writers, uh, working actually uh, in conjunction with Games Workshop. Uh, but you have to move to Nottingham if uh, uh, you uh, have to. Darn. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. They don't like moving out of country. Um, well, a wonderful thing. Like, darn, do we? The, in the for the freelance writers, yeah, that, that's not a problem. I, I mean, as it, um, the way things have worked out, I think. Um, there's there's only two of us right now, maybe three in North America who are working for them. Um, I'm the only Canadian, and I think there's one, maybe two Americans who are uh, working with them. So that's just, uh, the, the, I think, largely the way this worked out, because most of the work is done by email and Skype. Uh, anyway, in this particular instance, that the, they're looking for full-time uh, writers that be working in conjunction with the studio, and so that really requires you being on site. Because in 2008, I asked them for proofreading tests, and I said, "Well, do you live here in London or in the UK or right now?" And they all just said, "Well, we can't do that. It's postage costs." I'm thinking, it's 2008, and you can't email me to get. They were certainly still even the, uh, I think when they I, do now. yeah when they when I started work uh, for them in. This has been about 2012 or thereabouts. Uh, the, the first few contracts I got were still being mailed out. Uh, that, that is no longer the case. For proofreading. They've changed it now. It is? They, they sent me a proofreading test about two years ago. I was impressed that they didn't do it. Oh, OK. The other reason is that the, the um, marks are different yeah. for them in the UK. They are. And I kept looking going, I'm going to write on this, and I'm going to do it wrong. And Every license is different. Um, every license or licensing agreement is different. And usually there's a period of time this licensing agreement goes on. It can be anywhere between one year to five or indefinite based on sales. And the, the licensing agreement usually involves things like how many products that you have, um, what kind of experience 
exclusions, like things that you can't do when if there's a contract renewal. It has a lot of other sorts of things in like that. So once a company acquires a license, then they, they need to find people to work on the license. And in a lot of cases, especially for established settings, um, the major barrier to entry is knowledge of that world. Because there are some worlds which have a lot of setting. Um, Vampire the Masquerade, for example, is very setting intensive. It's been around for over 20 years. And even though there's been different iterations of the game lines, you still need to have a knowledge going into it to be able to write on it that requires you to do some research up front. So often a lot of game companies would prefer that um, if you are a writer interested in the property that you already know something about that property. Because coming into it cold means um, it's not necessarily that they are trying to turn people down for writing um, based on interest. It's just that it's easier to work with somebody if they already know the setting than to try to give them all the materials, especially with just the history. Time, they can, and they can run it yeah, it's it, it's basically a cost factor. It's a cost factor. <laughs> like a cost factor. You problem. need to be able to save time. And um, so when game companies, what they do is they when they go into production, it's either are they going to do a new system or are they going to use an established system or a flavor of the system? And then their production schedule is really tight. So things like being able to follow deadlines, I'm sure all of you follow deadlines, right? Awesome. Um, that's very important. Also understanding the difference between your version of the world versus what the licensor wants is also very important. Um, you know, for example, if you wanted to write about pink fluffy bunnies and my little pony, probably couldn't do that. Well, Unless it came from the licensor, unless they said, we want a whole sort of subculture of pink fluffy bunnies that kind of live under the radar and, you know, in Ponyville. Then I'm like, great, let's do it. But yeah, pitching that idea probably would be a little more. Yeah, and there's, there's often a lot of different layers to that, depending upon what you want to contribute to the conversation versus what you get out of it. Um, but, the, but the main thing is, besides the craft competency, you do need a craft competency. And often the craft competency is style to be able to match the style, especially of existing works that came before. Um, that's really important. But the other thing is, um, I would say the number one thing that I see people falling forward on in licensing and time, especially trying to get the job, is ego. If your ego cannot fit through the door, this is probably not the job for you. Because um, it's work for hire, which means that you'll get paid, but you don't own any of the rights to it. And somebody else owns the rights, which generally used to in the past anyway, I mean you would get paid more up front um, than your original work because you don't own the property. It used, it used to be that way, it's not necessarily that way now. But, um, but if, you, if you have a big ego and you want to bring all these things to the table and you're really not agreeable to work with, it's not necessarily because they're arguing about you about your craft, it's because your vision doesn't line up with what they want and what they're trying to do is, as you mentioned from your example, fill a hole. And the idea that you you have to be aware in media tie-ins, particularly this uh, topic of our conversation here, is that you are playing with somebody else's toys, literally. <laughs> you know, that you're in the whole joke, oh, we're playing in someone else's sandbox. You really are. So you, you're allowed to be creative, but you have certain parameters. Mm -hmm. you have to be if you're very writing mindful. Star Wars, you're, you better not be writing Star Trek stories in the Star Wars universe. You have, right? you have to be you're very writing. mindful of your boundaries. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not that it's the mean corporate overlords that are crushing the, you know, the, the, the wonderful you know, artistry. It's, it's, this is the job, fair is fair. And I remember being a little girl, you know, being a huge Star Wars fan, a huge Muppets fan, and being aware, uh, probably, <laughs> so nodded to the fact that I'd be a writer someday in this industry, that when I saw the media tie-ins, I could tell that it wasn't quite the voice of the characters, you know? Like, this is not really Luke Skywalker. It's Mark Hamill playing a part, and you know, they did commercials, and they did PSAs, or sort of these extra things back then. Like, well, it's, it's some things, I didn't know what it was, but even as a kid, like, this is not, it's not really Kermit the Frog. It's not really him. But Jeffrey Jewell was not writing this, and that's why it doesn't ring true. It doesn't have the, the authenticity of the character. So we now, I assume, all of us being fans and growing up and, and wanting to do this for a living, are very aware of that, you know, so that the people reading this who are fans of these properties want them to be done right and to ring true as the yeah. characters and the, the situations they know. It's, it's respect not just for the IP but for the readers. Like, there's a contract existing between the, you and, and the readers, and, and uh, there's 
that there's all kinds of, of room for creativity, mm -hmm. but uh, the you, 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 you cannot break the toys that you're being given the privilege to play with. And then throw a fit that the boss isn't allowing you to be creative, but kind of what you're saying, you've got to you know, check your ego and say, I can be creative, but within these, gosh, this has come up on almost every panel. I went to Montessori school as a preschooler. Apparently it's affected me deeply because I love to have a structure to be chaotic within. And <laughs> nothing's better than having uh, that kind of thing imposed on you. I think, you know, I know a lot of people, well, I don't want to have structure. I want to be able to write and be creative and free. I don't know, that kind of just becomes a mess. That you never kind of have to do yeah. that even with your own original work, otherwise you never get anything done. You need a beginning, middle, and end, or it'll never be over, I guess. <laughs> I, I tend to view it as not so much a restriction, so it's the difference between a sandbox, which is just a sandbox, and you can do whatever you want with uh, in it, or a sandbox that's got all kinds of toys in it. <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, so right. now you know, you can, you know, what can you do with or these painting toys? Or a that's a canvas that's a specific size, as opposed to the entire world, start painting. You know, yeah, where do I begin? What am I doing? I wanted to touch upon something that you said about fans. So um, something that's really interesting about fandom in general, and I think this is very important to keep in mind, especially with media tie-in, is that um, in my experiences, the longer that a property has been around, the harder it is to please all fans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because um, and, and I'll give you a good example of that because it's it's easy to bring up the example because I think it's a point of reference for everybody. It's the difference between the prequels and the original Star Wars movies. Mm -hmm. So I did not like the prequels. Um, I did not. Um, I appreciated them for the craft. Um, I thought the writing was very good and the, and the sets were amazing. Like, I thought the sets were amazing. But I didn't have that same sense of wonder as I had when I was a kid. And I realized as I went back and I've seen them several times already. Um, I realized the reason for that is because as a fan of the original, I was still expecting to see it through the mind of a child. And that's what those prequels were made for, was for kids. I disagree because the originals were made for kids too. We were kids mm -hmm. back then. Yeah. So I, 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 but I wasn't but a kid I, when oh, I saw the prequels. Oh, okay. No, nor was I. But, but the original Star Wars that we think of right. as, oh, you know, the, 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 the real Star Wars. The real, the real, <laughs> the old school Star Wars was made for children and thought of at the time as being fluffy and not real science fiction. So Yeah, yes. so so I think I actually think that the, the prequels were very poorly written for a lot of reasons. <laughs> but I, and I guess I'm not I'm not really stating my point very well. So um because I really love Star Wars, like and I love the original ones. Yeah. The prequels, I feel that the reason why I didn't respond to it as much as I did as Star Wars as a kid is because I was I was viewing it as an adult instead of as a kid. And I think you're, you're taking more responsibility onto yourself as a viewer than, than <laughs> that's but, kind of you, but I think the movies were, were very, very flawed in a lot of ways. But, 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 if I'm but I'm looking forward to the new one and I'm trying not to be spoiled, so nobody tell me anything all weekend. So back to the media time. Well, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, the, um, uh, there's the, uh, there's the, the fact that we have to take into account that uh, time correct? has passed. Well, yeah, with with and with uh, um, yeah, with properties that have been around for 20, 30 years or, or more. Transformers and Ninja Turtles and, and kids and Star Wars. And there's, there's going to be different iterations. There's going to be changes that are being uh, done by the owners of the IP, mm -hmm. which are not going to yeah, like I said, they're not going to please all fans. Uh, I mean, even. Even with a, something that's largely unchanged, there's no way that your interpretation is going to please everybody because it's still um, the you know the the er concept in their heads can't possibly match up with, with the, the reality of what you've just done. And sometimes you remember things differently. Like I, I went back and I watched Thundercats and I was like, wow, there's ten minutes of dialogue in the twenty minute episode. <laughs> there was like a whole five minutes where they were like trying not to thunder, be trying not to be language based so it could be international. Thunder. <laughs> Did you see the new one? No, I have not seen the new one. But um, but I, I think that I think that memory is really interesting as well when, when we think about things and really what we're talking about especially with fandom and what makes media tie and things so fascinating is the fact that fans they're not looking at it necessarily even when they talk about well um, Snape wouldn't do this or you know whatever the case may be they're really talking about the emotional connection to the characters who said it. And that's, that I think is one of the most fascinating and challenging things to do, regardless of what sort of property you're working on, because you're basically trying to connect to the fan on that emotional level. 
But I, I guess what I, what, what I was picking up on what you're saying, I think because I do most of my writing for children, and a lot of the properties we're now having to juggle fans my age and older, and all the way down younger, you know, two generations now pushing it, but let's say two generations down to the kids that are the actual audience for these things. Again, Transformers, um, Ninja Turtles, uh, <laughs> Thundercats, mm -hmm. um, certainly Batman and these things that are perennial. But Ben 10 is celebrating its 10th anniversary this December, which is me. You know, that seems like one of the new shows, and there's been a whole generation of kids who have grown up and, <laughs> uh, and looked back on their childhoods as having watched Ben 10, which <laughs> but the idea that, right, again, please jump in, um, writing for kids doesn't mean it has to, we're all grown ups here so I don't have to hedge my, my vocabulary up, but it doesn't have to suck. And I just remember going from Ghostbusters 1 to 2, uh, Harold Ramis, who I revere as a writer and love, I remember him saying, well, we all have daughters now, so we wanted to write a movie that our daughters could watch. I mean, you mean one that's not good? Like, Ghostbusters 1 was awesome. You had to write something that sucks for your daughters? That's horrible. You know, like, I'm offended as a, as a girl, you know. Um, I know they didn't mean it that way, or I hope they didn't mean it that way, but, but that kind of, you know, idea of writing for children's sensibilities, as opposed to just writing something that's good, that you remember, kind of what you're saying, about an emotional connection to the characters that you had as a child, and that you have as an adult, and sort of trying to find that balance within the audience, it's really wide, sweeping audience um, age and experience and all that. Um, but I don't know if that's a bad thing. I, don't, I think it's doable. I mean, some of us do it. <laughs> well, adults are audience participation factor, like Paris was saying earlier. I read uh, Willis, you know, Willis Pinell wrote this or her friend William um, oh. Prowler, and one or the other did it, and wrote the same companion. They said, the reason why Star Trek is what it is is because of what the fans brought to it, the audience brought to it. And that's why there's people like me look at it and say, well, I don't know it's that's stupid. Because it's stupid to me because I'm not bringing anything else to it. There's nothing there for me. Mm -hmm. And they brought all of this to it. It was very, you know, very important to them. Just like, you know, the real Star Wars to me is the real Star Wars. The other ones I'm like, I'm not gonna watch those. I hear they're crap. That one says crap. They're crap. They don't exist in my universe. But unfortunately, they exist in George Lucas's issue. For all the things I, I'm with you on that, I don't like them, but it's not my playground. My, my position on the Star Wars saga is okay, if, if you don't like the prequels, fine. But they're canon. Don't, don't pretend they don't exist yeah, because canon. you can't say, I like the New Testament, but I don't believe in the Old Testament. It's still, well, it's still there. It's still there. But it is still not there. anymore. I can say that. If you look at it from the perspective of a teen now, mm -hmm. my daughter, she watched the new Star Wars. She was kind of okay with it. She tried to get her to watch the old Star Wars, original okay. Star Wars, and it is nerdy. I cannot mm -hmm. sit through this. I don't slow want to watch also. it. Slow also. Kids will say it's slow. And remember back in right. the day they talked mm -hmm. about grown ups then say it's so fast. They're cutting. It's so, like the spaceships go through frame. You can't track anything. It's too fast. And you watch it now, yeah. even as an adult, and God, they took forever to go through the frame. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, that's, that's I know which ones my, my three year old yeah. likes to watch more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's some of the challenges because it's not just the writing that, the cha that changes, it's also the technology. Yeah. And it's the needs of the audience. And I mean, the and gaming. Society and you know, commercials and the other things that, they, that we're all exposed to. In, the, in, the um, in gaming, um, the biggest change has been from more encounter based gaming to um, opening up to different styles to be sometimes more character centric. Mm -hmm. And when you have different styles of gaming and different iterations of different things, and then you have media license properties on top of that. Um, some of the questions that you have to ask is, what is the purpose of this game trying to do? And in Firefly, um, we created a game that basically emulates like you're on a show. So every time you sit down to play a tabletop game, it feels like you're in an episode of Firefly because that was our goal. Other people that would, um, and there's other people that do prefer more encounter-based or more um, heavy on the stat blocks and the, the science and whatnot. They, you know, prefer a game more along the lines of Traveler instead. So it's like, there's also different types of preferences. And personal um, taste, I would say, among kids also. Not to say, all kids want this. The same way all adults don't want this in their property. Kids have all different tastes. It's, it's, that's what makes the world go around, right? <laughs> so going back to that point, do you think that the media tie-ins in game creation 
can that help focus more sales at, for an age group? Yes and no, um, because are you familiar with the term RPing? Okay, so when, when the technology changes, people will find different ways to do things. And a lot of things in gaming depends upon how the economy is doing. Because gaming is very social. Yes. And gaming you can also get a lot more money out of buying a board game that you play a lot or a tabletop game that you play a lot. Um, kids adapting technology using RPing create their, it, it's really fascinating from a sociological perspective because they create their own rules. So from a media tie-in property, the question is, can we do something that's so fantastic that will draw in people that are already doing these things for free by themselves, and we know they exist, or can we attach dice to this? Like, who is, who is really the audience for this? And when we were doing our game for Firefly, um, and even Masquerade, it's always a question of who the audience is, and I always feel that media tie-in properties in particular can attract new gamers easier absolutely. than, um, ex with the exception of D&D 5e, because D&D 5e is absolutely fantastic. But <laughs> um, I would say that media tie-in properties are have a less barrier to entry for the simple reason that people know and love characters. And if you know and love characters, it takes away one of the first objections of role-playing, which is, I don't know what kind of a character to make. But, What's really fascinating about that is most people, they don't want to play those characters for long term. They want to do that to learn the game, mm -hmm. and then they want to create their own characters in that world for that purpose and then go forward. And, and the, uh, the, the, the time properties can also have a life in some ways. It, though they're obviously connected to whatever the, internet, the, the IP is, they can go beyond that, right? So the, uh, if you look at the, the sales figures of uh, uh, you know, uh, Forgotten Realms or, uh, uh, or, or the Horus Heresy, they far, they, they, they're, they're over and above the number of people who are actually playing those games. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of overlap, but it's not, it's, uh, they're not being read only by the people who are playing those games. So they also have to stand as, you know, be, be uh, readable as stories on their own. So they, they start to develop their own, uh, their own following, their own readership. Uh, which you will know, then hopefully funnel, you know, uh, their intent is going to be to funnel those readers towards the property that these things are advertising. Uh, but they still have to, uh, in, in order for that to happen, they have to be good reads. Right. You brought up a really good point, uh, something I wanted to mention, just the whole concept of media tie-ins and what their overall purpose is, and it's twofold. It's to uh, sort of enhance the, ex the ongoing experience of a property that's currently alive, like in the day when X-Files was a big hit and they had all these X-Files novelizations and the X-Files, the old PC game and all this stuff. And that's that's one thing certainly during Ben 10 to run, you know, have, get as much, out, sort of squeeze as much out of it as you possibly can as far as the, 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 the licensor is concerned. But from the audience point of view, it's to, you, you love these characters currently on the air and you want, you know, I want to play The Simpsons, you know, various video games, or I want to, you know, read all these different uh, books. I wrote Gilmore Girls book, you know, tied into the end of the Gilmore Girls series. And we wouldn't have done that after it had, <laughs> had folded. But something like Star Trek or some of these other properties, Firefly is uh, certainly the case. It's kept alive in part past the time when the licensor actually is no longer promoting the initial project, the product. They're just keeping it alive in the fan community, I think, you know, sort of keeping everyone's interest, people who are interested in it, keeping them interested in it. Yeah, and so that when the time comes that they do a reboot or a, a new version or just revisit, well, they haven't lost the fans. The fan, it still exists. It still exists. It's still in the public eye. Exactly, it hasn't disappeared entirely from, from oh yeah, that firefly thing from years ago. Well, I mean, there's a lot of business reasons to do licensing, too. I mean, there's there's whole conventions that are trade-facing where that's what you have, is you basically have a bunch of studios and you have a bunch of agents that go around trying to sell licensing deals for different things. Um, it's a way for the creator of the property to make money. Certainly the fans are a factor. Um, but usually when you see like a bubble of a whole bunch of things happening all at once, it's because there were some business considerations that were made and every business is different. Like, you know, some businesses, they want one company to handle all forms of gaming. It doesn't matter what type of gaming it is. Other companies will 
say, you can do the card game, you can do the board game, you can do this, you can do that. I mean, it, it just depends upon what the licensor wants. Um, the fans, I would definitely say, are a consideration, but they are not the only consideration to do business because, because for the simple fact that there's a lot of things that are kind of, um, being on the internet is almost like looking through a funnel sphere because sometimes it's a little distorted. Um, because just because things are popular online doesn't necessarily mean that people are paying money on them. Mm -hmm. So there's there's all these other things that happen offline. Um, like I was a big part of, for example, the um, I'm a big Paul Blazer fan, and I was part of the Constantine. Try to save the show. Try to save the show. Yeah. Try to save Constantine. And they were going by the number of views, the number of Twitter followers, all this other kinds of stuff. And you know, so they had metrics that they wanted to use, that, and then they kept pitching. They were very public about this. You can find all of this online. Um, so every business and every studio is very different with the way that they make their business considerations. I feel like we're dominating the conversation, and we should really just leap in or ask a question or something. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I, I am. You don't want to interrupt, but interrupt them. I'm learning. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning. Well, well, um, there, there's, there's, there's different. As we found out by listening to how what we each do and how we got into it, yeah. there's, there's so many different divisions of media, yeah, tie-in so writing, sure, so. and, um, and with with what I do with novelizations, there isn't really all that expansion and everything. There's, you know, you do this one single time. thing, and it's. No, probably. Um, do you deal you, with the licensor at all when you're writing novelizations, or with just with your editor, or how, what's the chain? I dealt. I dealt directly with the the film production company. Oh wow, awesome! Uh, and uh, it was it was really one of the really great advantages of doing a novelization uh, is you know there's there's no budget constraints. You know, it, I, you can put anything on on paper and it'll work. You don't have to worry about what'll work on film and what won't. Uh, and has anyone ever read uh, Alan Dean Foster's Alien 3 novelization? Oh, wait, no, sorry. Okay. Alan Dean Foster, I'm thinking, writes a lot of media times. He's, 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 he's the go Alan Dean Foster is the go to guy. You know, if, if he's not busy, you know, you know, write a big check to Alan Dean Foster, and, and he's your guy. Yeah, not, right? Yeah, right? <laughs> um, Something like that. Well, yeah. well, and you know, well, and see, that's just it with novelizations. Usually, you have at the very most two months to write an entire novel, and I don't write that fast. I was very lucky. I got, um, I got a little over six months to do War of the Worlds Collide, and that was the shortest time it took me to write a novel. Uh, but Alan Dean Foster's novelization of Alien Three, when I remember. Reading that and thinking, my God, this is nothing like the movie, at at all. <laughs> well, it, 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 I mean, everything was totally different. And then uh, several years later, they released the Alien Quadrilogy box set, and they put out the assembly cut of Alien Three, and it was almost word for word the novelization. And, and that's because Alan Dean Foster uh, worked from the script, not the finished film. And most of the time that's most of the time we don't get to see I was lucky I got to see War of the Worlds Goliath. Um, but a lot of times we don't get to see the film. Sometimes we don't get to see concept art or anything. Um, I believe Alex Irvine, when he did Pacific Rim, uh, Guillermo del Toro gave him everything and showed him who sat with him and showed him the movie and was like, oh my God, see that ain't that cool. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I read that that, that uh, Alex got that experience, but a lot of times we just get this this script, and it's like, all right, you've got four weeks, hammer this sucker out. And uh, but Alan Dean Foster hated the script for Alien Three, and, and well, he was very angry about what happened to Hicks and Newt, and he demanded that he be able to change their fate. And of course, Fox said, no. No, you can't. You can't do that. So that's why he didn't do any more Alien after that. That's why AC Crispin did the fourth one. Uh, but but back to what I was saying about being able to do that uh, to put more in. Now that we have DVD, we get to see deleted scenes all the time. But back before that, we didn't really get to see all that stuff that went on that fell on the editing room floor. 
And the, the novelization was where you got that because they got to write it before they started cutting. And one of the first things that the director of Goliath wanted me to do was he wanted me to put the original opening in. It was supposed to open in St. Petersburg in uh, the original Martian invasion and he wanted a thousand Cossacks on horseback charging tripods. And we, we can't animate that. It, it, that would cost a fortune to animate. So I got to put that in for him and he was thrilled with it. Um, and there is an R-rated cut of the film, but it hasn't been released. They cut it to PG-13. And uh, a lot of fans, when it came out, they're like, well, where's the love scene? You cut the sex scene out. I put it back in. Does yeah. <laughs> anybody have any questions, please? It's, it's such an intimate crowd here. Just feel free to. Well, with the novelizations, um, it, this is going to sound insulting, and it's not meant that way, but how much are you actually writing as opposed to just taking what's in the script and putting uh, description around it? I mean, well, see, I, see, that is part of the negative stigma behind writing novelizations. Everyone thinks, well, they, you know, they're hack writers. They, you know, they, they, they write paid fan fiction. Yeah, they don't have to actually do any real work. Um, Since I honestly don't know, that's... I, mean, I don't want it to sound insulting. No, it, it, it's, it's something that comes up all the time. Uh, it's, I, you know, I thought it would be easier than it was. Uh, I mean, yeah, that, that is, uh, some, some, some tie-in writers do that. They actually, you know, basically put the script into Microsoft Word and, and start chopping it apart and, uh, and building from it. I don't, I don't do that. I write from scratch from, from what I see. Uh, Sure. Okay, so um, so one of the things that often comes up is, what is the difference between a novelization and a movie? The movie, all scripts are read, written to air in a certain time period, right? So they're supposed to air in 90 minutes or two hours or whatever. Right? A novelization doesn't have a set time period. So if you take a 90 minute, it, it generally the perfect length to adapt into a film screenplay is actually a novel length. This is about half the size of what a regular novel is. So, so you have to go. Pardon? About 50,000 words. Yes. It can be less, but it's probably about 50 to 70,000 words. So, um, so one of the things that a lot of novelization writers do is is they deepen the world building, mm -hmm. not just from the script's perspective, because it depends upon the way the script is written. I don't know if you've seen. Um, scripts the way they're written, but a lot of times they're not, a lot of times there's um, maybe some description, very but, little usually. but sometimes it's very little because basically they're going based off of what costumes are available and what sets are available to film the movie. They are doing, they are specifically trying to put together the instructions in order to film this on the sets with the materials and the actors that they have. The novelization is going deeper, especially on characterization, motivation, um, setting description, um, and that that is where a lot of the, the work comes in because basically you are painting in the details as opposed to just... Has, has anyone ever read Orson Scott Card's novelization of The Abyss? My, yeah. my God, that's a fine novelization. And the first 100 to 150 pages is all material that was not in the movie, not in the script. It was all backstory for uh, the three main characters. And I, I, I read that and I, I just couldn't believe how much how much depth he added with that. He really put his heart and soul into that novelization. Do you run into any problems with licensors that won't allow us to do that anymore? When I think of the first portion, so I have Scott Clark, you know, had Cloud Ben, who had The Abyss uh, many years ago, but now, I'm not thinking like Disney, certain, certain companies that have their version of the characters, their backstories already in place, and you will not you can still play different. within it, but it's all different because you have you, you have some licensors that are very strict. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I I can think of one where they want everything from the art notes to the um, outlines to everything. Like there are like three or five layers of approval on this. Other other licensors only care about art. I mean, there's there's others that care about canon. There's others that want to see you come up with the exclusions list. It's all different based on whoever the property is. Disney is the elephant in the room, um, but Disney and I don't knows necessarily what disagree. Disney I also don't necessarily best. disagree with them because they, they they don't have the title 
and it's awful. They have a title, and most of the stuff is wonderful. So I think they do a great job with time. Well, Disney now owns and Star Wars and Marvel, and they own a lot of different properties. And Disney knows what Disney does best. And, um, and, and the there's is a huge part of which I think you know the, the marketing, the merchandising is a huge part of what they do best. And, mm -hmm. and so taking characters, even something that once upon a time, you know, taking characters out of context and putting them in this sort of whole new, new uh, situation, but it's still got a, it, it's a way to introduce new viewers, kind of like you're saying, yeah. the entry entry uh, point for gaming is the entry point to sort of this greater Disney uh, canon, uh, you know, the entire canon of their entire library, I guess I should say, um, something who doesn't know, you know, Beauty and the Beast, because if you know, you've seen it, sees, sees the, the characters and then goes, oh, this is her now, actually an interesting point about uh, complaints about media tie-ins or, or taking like a, a, not a book and turning it into a movie or the other way around is that the original that you the original version of it that you love still exists it's not like it's wiped off the map and you know now you don't get to enjoy and the same thing I could say with the Star Wars movies and my son you know I I don't have to and I, I acknowledge you know the first uh, the, what I think of the latter-day Star Wars movies you know one two and three but uh, to me, they, they don't, the characters, characterizations don't ring true, and, and uh, the problems I have with them are not like Jar Jar Binks, I, that's the least of my concerns. <laughs> uh, that kind of thing, but, I, but that doesn't mean that the old trilogy has been, you know, eradicated from history. I can still watch it, or the, if there's a book that's been made into a movie, and I don't like the movie that they made, I can still pull the book off no, the shelf and still there. I suppose Star Wars is a bit of an unfortunate example because the original trilogy has almost effectively been erased from the history <laughs> well, as far as the original versions are concerned. Well, it's a rare, almost. I was just going to say that they're still around. They're not for sale. You know, uh, they were for a while. But they are now. Yeah. I mean, they are now, but you had to buy them then. Yeah. They'll be back. You know, they there's a dollar to be made. <laughs> in Dream Park, one of the characters actually says they're, they're in a, uh, one of the first LARPs ever one character says, I have a black market edition of Star Wars. And the others look at me and say, you think that we're supposed to be in 1955? That's a bit of an anachronism. But we're going to take it on spec that you're a real good thief. Yeah, think about that. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have any other questions on this? I know we're the panelists, but I hate to dominate. You know, what about uh, AU of AU? Let's, let's ask. Hmm? What about AU of AU? Okay. Yeah. Aside, from the, aside from projects you currently are working on, <laughs> What would be the dream off? What would Hellboy. be the dream offer? No, the one you would just say yes to. <laughs> Sesame Street. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> Hellboy. And what, <laughs> one, <laughs> and what one would you not would you not entertain unless they backed up a dump truck full of gold bars? <laughs> Porn. <laughs> so, um, how many gold bars? <laughs> so I would say that normally any setting that I don't know very well, if I'm not already interested in it in some fashion. I have to be very careful about the decisions that I make because it, it's a time factor, right? So if I don't know anything about, um, for example, I love the Minions, but if I didn't know anything about the Minions and there was all of this properties and like all these movies or whatever, and somebody came to me and said, well, do you think, do you want to do a Minions thing? The first thing I would do is I would go out and I would consume some of that media if I didn't already know it. And if I didn't like it, I would have to think very carefully about what kind of job I would be able to do. Because there's just I know some genres that already that I'm not that's not my preferred flavor. Like gruesome, uh, you know, porn was the joke answer, but that's that's your answer too. But I'm not into gruesome horror. You know, I like horror if it if it's going to scare me, startle me, or you know, sort of this atmospheric, but just like the saw kind of just this blood spurting. Situation. That's not horror. That's torture porn. And, okay, that's well, <laughs> yeah, just the right word. That's the kind of thing I don't I don't enjoy as a viewer. And, I don't think I could write it. Although my late husband said I probably should write it because anything that is happening on screen is nowhere near what I think is going on. Like even something like Silence of the Lambs, mm -hmm. I only saw half of that movie. I was watching it. Like every time the music builds up or you hear that Wolverine claws unsheathing, you know, in any context, but if it's a knife kind of unsheathing sound, I'm like, okay, tell me what's over when the music dies down. <laughs> so that's just not my personal taste. But you may have been right there. What I'm imagining is probably far more gruesome than what they're doing on screen. So, you know, you really should probably try that. But one of these days, I guess, never seen that. I would 
would, I would second the point about it, you, know, you need to have an enthusiasm for the whatever the universe is that, that you're doing. But even if uh, I, mean, I remember when I was um, uh, before I uh, wound up with, with Black Library and I was uh, um, looking at some other uh, novelizations, I read a, um, a a supernatural novelization. It was well done, Tim but Wagner. wait, what? Tim Wagner. Um, I th I'm trying to remember. It might have been. I'm not sure if it was his or not. But the. Um, but I also realized that I had no particular investment um, in it so that this would not be a good project uh, for me. And it wasn't that I, ha I was antagonistic towards it, it just, mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't think I'd do a good job, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be for me. However, um, if I had a chance to do anything Godzilla related, I'd be all over that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 More questions? Because I understand the time and the decision and the money that is often involved in television and movies, and I give a lot of those creators a lot of respect. Um, there are a lot of TV shows that are shot in a day, and you know they're shown a week, and then you know 10, 15 years later we're watching that show and we're wondering what happened. We don't know what happened. It could have been a network. It could have been a conflict of interest between the writer and the editor. Um, the actor couldn't have said the lines, and they only had one take. They couldn't get the set for the day. I mean, it is a miracle that television and movie gets made. I think it's fantastic. It's like, to me, it's always a miracle that anything gets made, and it's a double miracle when it's ever any good. It's like, oh my god, this is actually, how, how did this happen? So for a property like Sherlock Holmes, um, Sherlock Holmes is, um, there's a difference between, in, in my mind, between an iconic character, which is somebody that is just, you know, you always know that it's going to be this character no matter what, versus an evolving character. And Sherlock Holmes, um, especially with the stuff that Moffat has done recently, is kind of both. I, I think it's fantastic that writers want to tell more stories and more worlds, and I think we need more experimentation. Um, I am the big advocate for having a female Doctor Who, because this has been a character that has been around for 50 years, yes. and the ability to tell more stories for, that are not romance related, that are not about the unattainable get, I think is fantastic. Um, you know, as a writer, you want to be able to not just write the same thing all the time because you'll get bored eventually. And when we see these evolutions in these different stories, that's where that's coming from. It's coming from a passion for that character to try something new. And I'm always up for that. I think that's really great. Was it kind of cheating that they made the masters more humans than the I don't think it's no, cheating. That's not that it's actually cheating. possible. Yeah, that, that was the trial mode. Okay. Yeah. Because I don't want you to He said that in the interview. The only way to make sure that the mass audience would, would follow this, if we ever, you know, if anyone ever does hold a pin on the grenade and can't go up with a female doctor, is try it on another time lord that we already know, mm -hmm. uh, the, you know the obvious candidate for the new series is the master. So, okay. and, the, and the audience saw it. Better late than never. Well, you have to touch on a point that you bring up in the back because I think it's really important. So there's this, there's this, um, so one of the biggest conflicts that I often see with fans uh, looking at different properties is the question of canon, okay? People that are with the property since the beginning will have a very different view on canon than people that get into it five years, you know, 10 years, whatever. Fans and canon is very, I feel like an emotional thing from a business perspective. There's a lot of considerations for canon that the fans never even know about. So, um, you know, when Disney bought up Marvel and when also with Star Wars and they announced that they were rebooting Star Wars, all of the old canon went away. The same thing happened when the prequels were announced because um, I was a big fan of the Star Wars Extended Universe novels and I had read a lot of those novels. So, canon changes a lot and a lot of time um, and it has to continually change in order to tell the stories and keep telling the stories but some fans depending upon how often you read books or how rapid of a fan you are and whatnot may not have that same um, entry point uh, it's kind of a little bit like the new Marvel and the DC rebooting everything 
how many iterations of Superman have we had and whatnot. It's, like, it's because Doctor Who was a great example too. Yeah, I mean Doctor Who. Yeah, right that's but it's actually maintained its its original canon in the television series. It's a bit. They're also different filmmakers and different writers. The way that they do their things over in yeah. Britain than they do here. Um, so you know, there's there's all different kinds of considerations to make. Um, yeah, there is there is all kinds of spin-off media. Great, so. there's there there all is all kinds of spin-off media. Sure. Not, you know, and there you, you always you always know, have the debate: Does this one? Do I have to you know, listen to all the audio plays and already get this thing in the show? No, you don't, because the show will sometimes do things that conflict with those audio plays, and, mm. or even they rewrite one of the audio plays for a television episode. So it's almost as like, I, I was thinking in the Doctor Who terms, and, and maybe if this applies to other media too, is major and minor leagues. It's the same as sport. You can still enjoy watching a baseball game, whether you're at a major league park or a minor league park, but when it comes to the record books, and who you put in the Hall of Fame and all that sort of thing, it's the major yeah. league. Yeah. I, I, think it does it yeah, I, I think of a little bit more like a spider web because in that case that could have been a, like when you said that about the audiobooks having different canons to me that would be a licensing thing because then that means that they licensed the audiobooks to somebody else maybe somebody else was doing the books. yeah they were so um, but sometimes so the BBC like themselves put some audio too secondary as yes. because I, I, I don't want to infer that anything that's secondary is lesser quality it's not it's a lesser quality things. but when it comes to canon right if it's not in the actual show or whatever the primary property is, right? It's, if it's, people it's, making the primary property are paying attention to it and are including it, yeah, then it is. But if the writer on the next season is expected to uh, is not expected to, to know what the Cybermen did in this audio play mm -hmm. five years ago, and they do something that conflicts with it, then well, or like the Star Trek with all the novelizations, yeah. right? In addition to all the TV yeah. series, yeah, there's, there's usually movies. a setting bible for that that yeah. removes a lot of those. But I, I really like your major minor league uh, paradigm, and I may steal it, but I'll attribute it to you. <laughs> that's one of the challenges too with the. Introduce yourself. Tell us how you got involved in the in the media uh, well, time, and you've got eight minutes. Go. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> don't, those don't work. No. Oh, we're sharing. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I'm really sorry, folks. I was I was actually doing a, a comedy show over about, about 15 miles from here tonight, and I was my cab was supposed to be there at the end of the show, and then it, they were like, "Well, you, know, you didn't answer our call, so we didn't think you needed us anymore." It's like, yeah, that's that's what you should assume. So I'm here now. But anyway, I know my name is Patrick Tomlinson. Uh, I've I've got a, a pair of novels coming out. The first one's in November, uh, which is not tie-in. Um, yeah, but I have written tie-in work before for um, uh, Battletech uh, on the Battlefront forums, um, and uh, it's also written in, in other people's worlds uh, once or twice with uh, Shane Moore and his uh, uh, his Where Rats Tales books and his Abyss Market books. So uh, that's why I'm here with six minutes to go. Uh, how, how did you get into playing media tie-in work in particular? We kind of all worked uh, I got I got drunk at Gen Con and somebody <laughs> asked me if I liked robots and I think his name was Jason and that's how I <laughs> that's how I got into that so. So we all need to. Do so I was just thinking. Yes, you okay, all need so to go to go, go get drunk at Gen Con. Saying, yeah. <laughs> now Gen Con's got a really spectacular it's a literary track now called the Writer's Symposium which uh, if you guys have not been to that before it's it's a, really a, become a con within a con and it's spectacular. Um, I'll be. I'll be presenting there again. I'm pretty sure Monica's presenting there again. Yeah, um, and they have hundreds of hours of literary programming. Um, there's about 80 or 90 of us, I think, that are that are going to be panelists there this year. So if you're going to Gen Con, check that out. It's it's up on the second floor in the back, um, over by where the dealers' room is. So uh, and they they cover everything you can imagine. So yeah. Everybody to, to tweet and, and get the fans to vote for you. But 
I, I think the decision was made back in April. I think the judges were done. <laughs> so now they're just keeping us in suspense. Does anybody have one last awesome wrap up question? Are you enjoying the Absolutely. Absolutely. All I gotta say is convergence. This is the <laughs> second time I've been at convergence and it's far and away the most fun. They certainly treat us, I don't know about you guys, but the best of any other con. I just go above and be so organized, professional. Mm -hmm. I, I never I can't get over it. <laughs> Why aren't other con after this I've got two days at home and then I'm at San Diego at Comic Con and I know it's not going to be <laughs> as smoothly run as this. So they sort still of, do the, the sort of thing where the volunteers like kind of turn up in front after everyone comes into the con and they decide whether or not they need volunteers that day, so it's all real slapdash. That I don't know. I, and I've never worked there behind the scenes well, no, or anything. Right. Just from when sort you of. Go, when you go in, if you're in the front and you see like this big herd of people and they're all like this, mm -hmm. those are the volunteers that are basically, so they say, well, no, we decided we don't need anyone else. Everybody oh, I see. Need. So they're the, they're the and then in the stand by volunteers. No volunteers. Yeah, they, they I think there's more organization now. Yeah, yeah there's more. I'm just talking about dealing with the guests. That, that, uh, uh, next, next panel, or do you want to have our last slam bam <laughs> question <laughs> uh, from the audience about yeah. media tie-ins? Go, you're on the spot. I haven't been here, so I'm probably going to ask something that everybody else asks. That's all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Patrick didn't have a chance. I, 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 have, I, have, I haven't been here either, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, hey, uh, well, what's, the biggest, you well, what's, the, what's the biggest challenge you've uh, faced with writing media tie-ins? Uh, there's, there's a lot of research that I'm sure this has been covered, but um, there, there's just a, there's a lot of extra research that goes into it, um, especially with, like, the, and I've, I've only done a handful of stories for, the, for Battletech, and they didn't even all get taken up, um, but especially with something like uh, a property based on, on, you know, miniatures gaming, there's some nitpicky nerds, and so if you're yeah. if you're gonna write it, you have to get everything absolutely right. And if you try to if you, if you try to you know fake it, there you're gonna get called out on it really really quickly. Um, and it's but that's really not any different from writing like any sort of hard sci-fi stuff. You just you just gotta get the numbers right. That's all. That's right. Yeah, it's it's like that for everything. But like each each world's got its own canon. And each world's got its own its own rules, and if you're, I, I would never accept a, t a media tie-in of something I wasn't already a fan of, because there's no way, if it wasn't something I already loved and was already deep in, I, I wouldn't, I, yeah, I wouldn't even know when I was making a mistake. So. <laughs> if somebody dumped, you know, back in the dump truck full of gold bars? Hmm? Well, yeah, as long as they were non-refundable, you know, it's like if they were just <laughs> staying with me, and then, yeah, that's fine. So what would your dream project be? Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, what, which one would you avoid? Like, you'd be afraid that you wouldn't want to be involved with. Like of the of the big. Of, of any sort of any job that came along, you're like, ooh, that's just not me. Mm. Um, I, I'm not doing a Fifty Shades of Grey. So. <laughs> 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 From the point of view of the bed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably aren't. Well, there's no more questions. I think. Thank you.